people, which is a welcome change than the telephone. Dr. Chris Tool from the Lindner Center for Hope. Dr. Tool, pleasure to have you in today. Oh, thank you, Brian. Nice to be here. And a perfect day for it because we were talking this morning at 630 with Dave Hatter, our tech guru. We do a t- uh, segment at 630 every Friday called Tech Friday. And today he talked about internet addiction. And he pointed out as one of the caveats that it really hasn't been truly recognized by the medical community as an addiction, unlike what you came here to talk about today, which seems to be sort of a subset of the broader category, gaming, video game addiction. Yes. So I'm of the mind and Dave is of the mind and I just want to get your reaction. Um, Are we just really one step away from the medical community formally recognize the broader category of Internet addiction? Well, uh, back in June of last summer uh, that the World Health Organization did identify uh, gaming disorder as a mental health concern. So we think over time that this will be something that we'll see more and more that's uh, is a diagnosable uh, disorder within the field, and one where treatment programs and insurance companies will start to cover. Okay, well, real quick here, because I, I do want you to explain the Linder Center for Hope's general mission and like, but before I get to that, since we're on this specific topic, like all DSM-5 diagnoses, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever different factors that make up a diagnosis for anything. What is, what would comprise a diagnosis for a video game or gaming addiction? What are we looking for? What are the factors the medical community is looking for before they make a diagnosis? Well, you know, some of this diagnosis that we're looking at can be also be applied to what we see with folks that have problem gambling. Oh. So is there a preoccupation with this type of behavior? Um, does a person also feel that they need to engage in more, uh, more and more technology? Um, does the child, for example, have a tendency to withdraw from social situations? Do they prefer using their digital devices over playing sports or going out with friends or uh, really being involved in activities that I used to be? So it's looking at, is there a loss of control? Is it compulsive? And probably the most important piece, do I continue to do it despite the negative consequences? Do it in spite of negative consequences. That seems to be a a catch-all for most addictions. Correct. Um, Is there this in the broader concept of mental health problems, um, I always kind of think there's this sort of, you know, 5%. It's like, yeah, there's always going to be a percentage of people out there that are going to be predisposed to addiction, whether it's drugs or alcohol, Internet, gambling, uh, anything like that. Are they all cut from the same chunk of cloth? In other words, are certain brains just naturally wired to have addictive tendencies, and some people will drift over to gambling addiction while others might seek drugs or alcohol or are these all distinct categories? I just kind of feel it's all sort of, they're, they're closely related in some regard. Yes, I think they are. You know, when it, when it really comes down to it, the brain really doesn't care what it is. It doesn't care if I pour it down my throat or put it in my nose or see it with my eyes or do it with my hands. A lot of the same neurochemicals are happening within the brain. You're doing so, it for the reward then. Correct, yes. But we don't, I mean, I think that's where some people struggle with even thinking of gaming as an addiction or internet as a broader category of addiction because, wait a second. I'm just sitting in front of a computer. I'm not getting anything out of it. But right. your brain really is getting, is it dopamine? Is that the, the dopamine, drug? Uh, yes, uh, dopamine is one of the chemicals. Chemical, uh, I should we say. We also know about glutamate and a lot of these neurochemicals that reinforce this behavior, increase that memory capacity to uh, to engage in this behavior once again. When I feel maybe distressed or depressed or anxious, you know, a lot of people can game. A lot of people, for example, can drink. And it doesn't become problematic. They can go to parties, celebrations, holidays. It doesn't become out of control or compulsive. Same thing with gaming. A lot of people can game. A lot of people can use the Internet. But there is a small percentage of folks, though, where it does become problematic, out of control. Now, are the treatment methodologies analogous for these different? I mean, if you've identified that that particular brain type that's, that's sort of drawn addictive personality, if I may be so bold as to say that, are treatment methodologies similar? If you have someone that comes in for an alcohol problem, um, you're going to approach it a certain way. Uh, how about gaming? Are there overlaps in treatment? Well, there is some, but when we look at gaming as opposed to alcohol, for example, al- alcohol we can abstain. The Internet uh, is always going to be around. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mentioned that earlier, and that's kind of the reason I brought it up, because a treatment program to get you off of drugs means you are going to abstain from that point forward. Correct. And you've yes. got methods and techniques and sometimes separate drugs, pharmaceutical drugs that you can prescribe to help people with that addiction. But if you go in 
for internet problems or maybe gaming problems, that seems more voluntary than internet. I mean, you're going to go out knowing my job requires me to be on the internet. I was talking to you about that. I could not stay away from the internet because I must have it to adequately perform this job. I need news. I need real time events. I would just be back to square one. Right. So, you know, I think what, what the key is for treatment is how do I regulate this? How do I uh, use the Internet for what's healthy? How do I moderate it in a way that keeps me in a healthy place with that? Talking about Nancy so, Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Donald Trump all day long cannot be healthy. <laughs> <laughs> so, Come on. So, so, um, <laughs> so we want to help that, that, that client or that patient to be able to, how do I manage to use this uh, this uh, service, for, service thing, yeah. right, as a way to keep it healthy for me. So we know it's going to be a part of school. We know it's a part of work. It's in our cars. It's going to be everywhere around. So how can I manage it in a healthy way? Kind of almost like nutrition. What's healthy? What's unhealthy? What's the sugar? What's the vegetables? You know, um, the sugar can be the hyper surfing, hyper texting, pornography, gaming. And that so channeling uh, and I see that like for when you say pornography, um, that would be a bad thing to spend hours and hours a day on. And we hear about stories like government workers, for example, I've read stories where that's what they did for their job all day long, not Mm -hmm. terminated, which was the context which would come up here. But that is obviously an addictive addiction problem there. If you're sitting there in front of porn for eight hours a day, every day, you got a problem on your hands. So what you would do is would be to. Um, when, 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 when treating your patients, help them channel away from the bad. Now, you can be online, but what you have to remember is there's good and there's bad. It's like good neighborhoods, bad neighborhoods. You want to stay away from the bad. So don't serve porn, but you can go over to, I don't know, CNN and read an article. Right. So, so we do know about 80% of folks that have a substance use or addictive behaviors also have a co-occurring mental health issue. So they coexist. That's more the rule than the exception. So a lot of folks who have this problem also have underlying depression, anxiety, trauma, abuse. So what we do in our reboot program, that's the name of our program at the Linder Center, is that we do a thorough diagnostic to determine what might be these co-occurring elements that this is like on. self-medication in, 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 in with, with drug and alcohol yes. addiction. you got an underlying mental health problem like generalized anxiety. Or, right. And what you're doing is in order to relieve yourself of the anxiety, washing down some Jack Daniels to uh, numb. Exactly. This video game works the same way. Now, what would you see with children? I mean, younger people, well, obviously, you know, they don't have the stresses of job and career and family and bills and worries about retirement, but they obviously have problems of their own. Is that you, where it's coming from? Well, yes, and they have have other stressors in their life too. I mean that that are going on. So what? Yeah, is I remember it? them. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so so what do you remember? Uh, so what uh, what does a person do in order to manage that? What is something that's accessible to me? I you know I'm not 21. I you know maybe I'm 12 and I can't go out and buy alcohol, but I can access the internet. I can game, and this takes it away. This disconnects me. It, it, you know what I'm thinking. Tell me if there's a parallel to be drawn here, because what you just said, I'm thinking of the young person who doesn't have access to the dangerous stuff, but still wants to self-medicate. They're turning to the game to get the thoughts, other thoughts that are running around their head away. In other words, it keeps them focused on something that's comforting or fun. Yes. And it makes those other thoughts it push, it pushes them to the background. Exactly. They're and left to their own devices. They're going to be thinking about the troubles, the yeah. anger, somebody yelled at them at school or bullied them, the girlfriend, boyfriend, relationship problems. They're all going to start running around their thoughts, and they hate that. Right. I mean, at our residential program uh, at the Linder, uh, Linder Center, we have a program called Williams House, which is a our residential program. And what we see there mostly are kids coming in with depression, anxiety. And so it becomes a way that I cope. It becomes a way that I disconnect, a way to numb out. And it gives me pleasure as I do it. I have some control of this, whereas other things in my life I don't have control of. Unbelievable. Dr. Chris Tool, don't go away because I want to continue. He's with Lindner Center for Hope, and they have this reboot program there for those that are struggling with Internet addiction or gaming addiction, I should say. Soon to be, I presume, uh, the broader category. We're going to learn maybe some uh, coping techniques that we can apply, maybe get some suggestions for what parents can do to help avoid the problem or signs they can look for to help maybe deal with that underlying mental health issue, identify it before it becomes a bigger problem after these brief words. Prestige Interiors. Find them online at prestige123.com. 819 right now, 55 Care City Talk Station. Really enjoying my conversation today with Dr. Chris Toole from the Lindner Center for Hope. 
they got treatment options, and we're talking today about uh, the concept of game addiction. You think of internet addiction, game addiction. We were talking internet addiction with again with this morning with Dave Hatter. You can check out those notes at 55KRC.com. Uh, before we dive into the same, maybe the signs we need to look for in our children or ourselves and maybe some little treatment points or something we can apply in our day-to-day lives to help us get over this problem where we're focusing all our attention on something else in order perhaps to address an underlying mental health problem. Let my listeners know about the Lindner Center for Hope, what you do there, and what other services you offer. Okay. Um, well, the Lindner Center of Hope has just uh, celebrated its 10th anniversary um, a few months ago, and it is um, a um, facility that really provides a continuum of care um, addressing uh, common and more complex mental illnesses. So we provide inpatient services, outpatient services. Uh, we have a research department. We have residential programs. Uh, we provide medication-assisted treatment. So it's really a very unique program, and we get we get referrals from all over the country. You know, oh, coming wow. to our facility. So um, uh, so it's a well-established program, and we're always in the process of expanding and looking at new areas to treat mental illness. But uh, certainly now seeing the, uh, at least uh, uh, within the field of addiction, this this co-occurring piece that we're seeing with, with mental health. Okay. And again, as you established in the last segment, and it makes perfect sense, you know, a lot of people who struggle with one addiction or another really are struggling with an underlying mental health issue. I mean, yeah, whether, about 80%. Yes. 80%. So yeah. that's the biggest chunk. I mean, that's a huge percentage. So... How does one identify this in our, let's say, young people? Because I would imagine with game addiction, although I knew no adults are out there doing it as well, but you know, parents are in a position to regulate their children's behavior before they move out of the house or go off to college. They can, you know, turn things off, take right. things away. Yes. What should we be looking for before we finally say this has got to end, or my son or daughter really needs to get over and get some treatment? Okay. Well, you know, definitely some of the warning signs is there. Um, are there behaviors that the child is engaged in vast amounts of time engaging in that So it's simple hours, quantity. Yes. I mean, I, mean, I have some, some patients that have gained for, uh, you know, in a single day, um, you know, 12 hours a day, you know. Um, so looking at are they preoccupied with this technology? Even when they're offline, are they thinking about it, thinking about the next time they're going back on? Um, do they tend to withdraw from social situations? But that, see, I would think that, you know, in, in terms of how g- games pl- are played these days, that the retort from the kid would be, no, this is my social situation. I'm online with all these people. We're talking right. while we're playing. We're communicating. We're actually having conversations and calling each other names like we would on the school <laughs> playground. Right. This is modern playground, Mom and Dad. I'm not addicted. Right. Well, that is true. I mean, a lot of games are now this multimedia online role-playing oh, yeah. game where you have a lot of your friends on there, and you've... F- and you think you're kind of connected because you can talk to one another, but really it's a pseudo connection. And and I think um, we're we're not going out to connect with people socially. We're not making new friends. I mean, since the 1950s, the number of close friends that we claim has um, has decreased. Over and I time. imagine of late precipitous uh, a decrease with with technology. They didn't have technology as we started tracking that down downward slope in the 50s. Right, right. can only imagine what it's like now. Yes. People don't even want to talk to each other on the phone anymore. They just want to text. Right. And I think that's one of the problems that we see, especially with young people. I mean, we've seen that the suicide rate in uh, in girls um, has increased 30% in the last 10 years. Yeah. And a similar number with, with boys as well. So I think a lot of times this disconnection um, – is a part of this problem. I mean, sometimes people feel that the opposite of, of, of addiction is not sobriety, but the opposite is connection. We're, we're losing this connection with one another. Well, would that be a, a something? I mean, obviously, you would encourage a connection to anyone. I mean, more people you're friends with, the better your mental health's going to be, and you're out communicating and maybe getting involved with other activities and the like. But is that a, 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 a prescribed thing? All right, your son, daughter has this problem. We're going to start by pairing off the time. And in place of that gaming time, Here's what I encourage you to do for them, or here's what I encourage them to do. What are some of the things you would ask that they do to substitute it, to to fill that gap, or to deal with the you know the Jones withdraw that they're going right. to have? Right. Right. Well, you know, I think one of the first things for a parent to realize is that this is not about badness per se. You know, years ago when we looked at alcoholism, we we used to think it was about oh. Uh, 
one's lack of morale, yeah, yeah, lack yeah. of willpower. Poor um, character. Right, yeah. right. But but because of our knowledge about the brain, we know that's not the case. And the same thing with this behavior, too. I mean, what, what looks to be bad, bad acts doesn't necessarily mean bad actors. And so sometimes as parents, we get frustrated, you know, because we get upset with them. They're not doing what we want them to do. And we, we have a knee-jerk reaction and we take away the game. But um, what really is going to be helpful is finding a strategy that can be helpful in developing other ways of that youth finding uh, ways of connecting with other people, finding other enjoyments, other pastimes that really get them outside, uh, which is something that we're literally, doing. Yes. yeah, Phys- um, <laughs> Figurati- figuratively and literally outside. Yes. Well, pause for a moment. We'll get one more segment with Dr. Tool from the Leonard Center for Hope. Because eight twenty nine. The 55 KRC, the talk station. Happy Friday. Say it out loud, Joey Ramone. What a wonderful world. Wonderful world because we got places like the Leonard Center for Hope helping us with uh, our struggles, our addictions. And today I have Dr. Uh, Chris Toole in studio talking about gaming addiction. A nice addition to Dave Hatter's comments this morning about Internet addiction generally. But gaming addiction, we identified the problems, what you parents can look for for your children and maybe even to yourselves. Preoccupation, a need for more and more, a withdrawal from... Social situations, you'd rather be online playing a game than actually out dealing with your friends or having fun with family, that kind of thing. And you do it and continue to do it in spite of some of the obvious harms it's bringing about. Lack of sleep, maybe sacrificing family and friends, a destructive sort of reality that goes along with any addiction. It's just like drugs or alcohol or you know sex or anything else. If you do it too much, it's a bad thing. Everything in excess can be bad. So here we are. We've got we have a parent or a, a someone who has self identified. You know, oh oh, that sounds like me. If it they're part of the eighty percent that are self medicating, in essence, if they're part of the eighty percent that have some underlying mental disorder that is the reason for this gaming addiction, is there something we can do uh, as parents? Oh, reach out to our children. I relate to you off air. I, I don't recall my parents, you know, having in-depth conversations about my mental health back in those days. And every child going through puberty or going through high school or that age, even elementary school kids can struggle with bullies or, you know, dealing with homework or social issues. Or maybe they got something else going on inside their brain. I don't know that I necessarily would have wanted to talk to my parents about it or open up to them about it. But how do we engage in this conversation, maybe figure it out and maybe get ahead of a problem before it gets too bad? Doctor? Well, you know, I think a lot of times when, when you might start to notice some things at home as a parent, uh, if your child's not really open to talking about these things with you, then I would seek out, you know, see um, see if that person or see if, if your child can access a, a therapist or a counselor to, to talk with. You know, a lot of times they feel that this is a safe place to talk. I, I mean, I don't feel maybe comfortable at home with my parents, but I can talk to this third party. I can talk to this other person, and maybe that will help them open up more if, if they're not going to do that at home with their parent. And, and you know, certainly we understand, you know, a lot of kids don't want to talk about these right. personal, emotional things with their parents, and sometimes having another another resource to do that can be helpful. So that, that might be the beginning of uh, really opening up that door to talk about maybe some of these underlying issues. Well, and I, a lot of people, I think, struggle with maybe this stigma of seeking out a counselor. But as you pointed out, this isn't bad behavior. This isn't on its face something that is, you know, socially damning. Or but you got the kid's playing a lot of video games. So what? That's not like he's out committing crimes or, you know, shooting up heroin or something. Right, right. So, I, all right, so th- counseling, therapy, and, of course, Linder Center for Hope has these programs. Um, now, this would not be an inpatient thing, would it, or would it? Well, our actually, our Reboot program is a is residential it? program, yes. So they would come in for a, um, a two-week diagnostic where we do a battery of psychological tests. Uh, no kidding. Yes, and then based on that, then they would transition more into the Reboot program, which is then is really a full 28-day program. So Wow. Um, so we would address a lot of these underlying issues as well as their Internet, working with the family, helping them, that youth be able to better manage their, their behaviors online when they return home, helping t- uh, those parents, coaching them to uh, better be able to manage this at home as well. So um, – 
Uh, there's a lot of services that go involved uh, that are involved in this process to help them. But yes, it is a residential program. How about and I never would have guessed that. Do you and I'm I'm thinking, for example, um, if you are dealing with someone who is addicted to like to pick a drug, heroin. Obviously, there's a potential for physical withdrawal. Are there withdrawal symptoms associated with you? I mean, you have to provide inpatient kids who've been stuck on the computer for 12 hours a day with a computer and access to gaming to sort of nurse them off of this, or do they go cold turkey? Well, uh, we, we do encourage them to, to have a limited amount of use. Uh, you know, part of the treatment is being able to uh, reintroduce the Internet to them. So they may come in for a digital detox. Yeah, actually. that's kind of what I'm thinking. Uh, but, but we do see we do see kids that have withdrawal symptoms where they're anxious, irritable, agitated, depressed when their gaming or their device is taken away. Wow. Agitated, irritated, depressed, angry. It sounds like a lot of the uh, pol- uh, p- people involved in politics that I have to deal with <laughs> regularly. Maybe they have an underlying mental <laughs> disorder, maybe, maybe doctor. So. <laughs> I'm going to get them into the Lindner Center for Hope. Folks, you can find more information on Lindner Center for Hope online at Lindner, L-I-N-D-N-E-R. That's Carl Lindner. You remember him? Lindner Center of Hope. I said it's four. I've been saying uh, four all morning. It's of hope. Dot com or dot org. All right, you got that? Lindner Center of Hope dot org. All the information there. Dr. Tool, it has been a real pleasure talking with you about this. A little depressing that it exists, but we can get out in front of it. We're going to avoid a lot of problems down the road. All right. Thanks, Brian, for having me. Real pleasure. 835 right now. We got stuff and things going on in and around downtown Cincinnati. A great